Now to the US and uh, President Biden is facing an impeachment inquiry for his involvement in the Biden family making millions in allegedly corrupt business dealings with foreign nationals and uh, attention is also turning to the performance of his veep Kamala Harris who is uh, uniquely unpopular even among Democrats but could she fail her way up to President Douglas? Well she certainly could. Um, the, the, the the Democrats have a real problem on their hands here. A majority of American voters now do not think that Joe Biden is fit to serve a second term. Several polls now show this. He's just, um, for, for all the goodwill in the world, uh, he's he's not cognitively at his best, let's say. And the American public realizes this. Well, of course, <laughs> this means that the inevitable thing is you go down to number two, the Veep, uh, as with LBJ and others in the past. Uh, well, unfortunately, as we've discussed before, Kamala Harris's approval ratings are uh, uh, somewhere around the level of the coronavirus. Um, it, she would be a fantastically <laughs> bad candidate for the Democrats to run, but they have this problem. They can't be seen, and once again, we go back to the identity politics thing, they can't be seen to not be giving the top job, if it were to come available, the top role, to the first female vice president from a minority racial group. So they have a problem. And unless they can find a way to uh, to, to, to promote her even further up, and there are there is talk, there is chatter in DC and elsewhere, whether or not Kamala could just be sort of edged onto the Supreme Court as a sort of uh, um, a reward prize. Unless that happens, they are stuck with her at some point as the candidate, uh, uh, and potentially at some point as the president, and that would be a disaster for the Democratic Party, and they know it. If Kamala Harris runs against Ron DeSantis, Donald Trump, or almost anybody else in the Republican field, the Democrats will lose in 2024. They know that, but the party is very good at surviving, and I suspect they're going to find a way around this problem. Well, one of the great survivors and one of the most senior Democrats, uh, Nancy Pelosi, provided this commentary on the P Veep's performance. Uh, apparently, Kamala doesn't have to do much because the vice president doesn't really have much to do. Have a listen to this. Do you think she is the, the best running mate, though? She's the vice president of the United States. So people say to me, well, why isn't she doing this or that? I said, because she's the vice president. That's the job description. You don't do that much. What an excruciating comment. And, of course, let's not forget that Nancy Pelosi, who's only in her early 80s, has announced this week that she's going to run uh, for another term in the Senate. So Nancy Pelosi's grip on power, if not reality, will, will remain undimmed. <laughs> <laughs> now let's go to Dove, which is partnering with a Black Lives Matter activist to promote fat liberation. This is despite Zayana Bryant being accused of wrongfully getting a white student expelled from the University of Virginia over a misheard remark. Uh, so she, Douglas, helped ruin a young woman's life and she gets an endorsement from Dove to promote this absurd notion that being morbidly obese is is perfectly fine. Uh, let's have a listen to her. So when I think about what fat liberation looks like to me, it looks like centering the voices and the experiences of those who live in and who maneuver through spaces and institutions in a fat body. Douglas, where is the accountability? Is this what privilege looks like? Oh, this is privilege writ large. This is black privilege and it's fat privilege. Uh, she can ruin a young woman's life and she can just move on. Uh, I don't think she should be able to, actually. I certainly don't think she should be given endorsements. And I think at the very least, we should question the whole premise that she's operating under. Fat liberation? What is fat liberation, Rita? This whole body positivity movement, uh, and not just people who are a little bit overweight, but people who are morbidly obese being celebrated, I, mean, I just see it as so dangerous. We've just come out of a pandemic where one of the biggest risk factors was being overweight, being obese or morbidly obese. Uh, and, and yet we seem to have completely forgotten that. And, of course, there's a whole bunch of other health issues that go with being that size. Uh, now, I want to speak to you about what's happening in Canada, where some school libraries have empty shelves after removing books published 
before 2008 in the name of equity. Canadian Broadcasting Corporation reports the uh, this new process intended to ensure library books are inclusive appears to have led some schools to remove thousands of books solely because they were published in 2008 or earlier. Douglas, uh, when we hear the word equity, things being done in the name of equity, we should start worrying. Absolutely. Equity is one of the, the one of the worst terms of the era. It's a smuggling term. A whole load of bad ideas get smuggled in behind the term equity. And uh, those shelves we just saw, I think they'll probably keep um, emptying out, and not because people are borrowing the books, but because people are chucking them away. Uh, th this year zero thing should be regarded with contempt, but also with a real degree of seriousness. This is akin to what we have seen in the past, thankfully currently not yet as bloody, but what we've seen in the past in Cambodia, uh, the Khmer Rouge, in uh, Mao's China, an attempt to do year zero. Why 2008 should be sort of year zero in the beginning of literature and <laughs> books, I do not know. But here's another thought, Rita. I would have thought that all of these, uh, since everything before 2008, of course, is just impossible to read because it could contain ideas that might challenge, upset, or even trigger somebody. Um, maybe the books that they've got um, since 2008 represent a diverse range of opinion. Maybe they include uh, uh, my books, maybe they include Jordan Peterson's. I just can't help thinking that they won't include that either. It's not just about things before 2008. It's about everything that doesn't go along with their projects since 2008, which will disappear as well. Um, these people should be ashamed of themselves. They will join all of the book burners of history and be regarded with contempt by future generations, who I, among others, will make sure will read about them. Now, Douglas, you've written in today's New York Post about a tiny Italian island, uh, Lampedusa. Uh, explain what is happening there and why you say it shows America the future of lawless immigration. It shows all of us the future of lawless immigration, Rita. Lampedusa is a tiny island. It's the southernmost island of Italy, and it's equidistant between, the, it, it, between Italy and North Africa. And as a result, in recent years, particularly in the last 15 years, it's become a place where migrants from Africa set off to land by boat in Lampedusa. I've been there myself. Uh, the population of the island is about 6,000 uh, Italians. Uh, in uh, just about... 36 hours this week, around 8,000 migrants arrived on Lampedusa. And my warning about this is, and Australia knows this better than anyone, my warning about this is, uh, if you allow illegal migration like this to keep going at such a rate, it's not just that you swamp a border town or an Italian island. It's that you push the problem away. You push it up, always hoping that it will just go further and further away and it will sort of dissolve into population. And it's not case. When you have migration at this speed, you are already talking about millions of people arriving every year illegally into your country. And at that stage, as we have discussed before, you basically not only don't have a country, you don't have a society. Douglas Murray, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Great pleasure as always.